T.S. Eliot worked for three hours per day. That's surprising. Hi friends, I'm Arpita Karva and in this video lecture we are going to talk about a lot more serious topic but then before that I would like to share a fun fact with you. I was reading a paper on T.S. Eliot and I found that he wrote his plays and poems partially on typewriter and partially with pen and paper and he said in one of the interview that he never worked more than three hours per day because he said that when I started writing I had an urge to write longer and longer but when I looked at the same work next day I never found anything satisfactory which I wrote beyond three hours so he decided that day that he's just going to write for three hours per day now I just wonder that can we do that like working for three hours and having fun the other day uh, I don't know but then if T.S. Eliot did that I am sure that it is going to work because even after working just three hours per day he wrote some of the most celebrated poems of literature including Wasteland, Ash Wednesday, Love Song of J.L. Frog and Holumen. He wrote some of the greatest plays Murder in the Cathedral and you know so many other interesting works was written by him but in this video lecture I am going to look at the essays written by T.S. Eliot because today in this video we are going to look at T.S. Eliot as a critic. The first topic that we are going to talk about is T.S. Eliot's concept of objective correlative. Objective correlative was a concept which T.S. Eliot discussed in his essay called Hamlet and his problems and this was a question of June 2011 so you must remember that T.S. Eliot has coined the term objective correlative in the essay Hamlet and his problems but don't mix it up the term objective correlative was initially for the first time used by an American painter whose name was Washington Alson. But this term was made famous by T.S. Eliot when he wrote a lot about this particular term, explained it to the people in the essay Hamlet and his problems. So what is objective correlative? Uh, in order to understand that better, I would like you to answer this question of mine that why horror movies always feature thunderstorm or why horror movies always have episodes shot in night. So they have a lot of episodes in the night. Most of the horror movies take place during night. Why is that so? Have you ever contemplated on this particular question? If not, then do it now because only after understanding this question, you will be able to understand the concept of objective correlative. Objective correlative is a very easy concept. T.S. Eliot wants us to believe that if a playwright or a novelist want to create an impact on the audience, if that particular playwright wants uh, the audience to feel a particular emotion it will only happen in a combination of object description images agar main chahti hu ki sirf ek uh, fool dikha ke main love ka image create kar lu reader ke mind mein it's not possible only when i mix four or five things together together i can evoke the emotion of love in the heart of the reader for example, if you look at the poems of Wordsworth or you look at poems of Robert Frost, you'll see that all the items in the nature are linked together to create that particular emotion, to evoke that emotion in the reader. Kabhi bhi aisa nahi hoga ki ek bohat hi sundar jage ki baat ho rahi hai, ek bohat happy mood ki baat ho rahi hai and achanak se the poet talks about thorns or the poem talks about blackness never will that happen why because all the good things must be linked together in order to evoke that particular emotion in the mind of the reader for example agar i am talking about a sunny day i would talk about flowers blooming i will talk about uh, you know the sun rising i will talk about the nature which is supporting my mood but i will never look at the negative aspects of nature i will never look at the dark side of the nature why because 
if i start looking at the dark side of the nature then the objective correlative will never happen in the poem objective correlative tabhi hoga when all the images all the pictures all the description put together evokes a same image in the mind of the reader and that is why if you look at horror movies you'll see that all the negative dark image are presented together and that is where we start feeling fearful that is where we start uh, having goosebumps because sari cheeze milke hamare andar wo reaction create karegi sirf ek cheez akele kabhi wo reaction create nahi kar sakti that is what ts eliot meant by the use of the term objective correlative the second important work written by ts eliot when it comes to literary criticism is metaphysical poetry it's an essay which was written as a review to j g greenson's essay uh, which talked about metaphysical lyrics and poetry of 17th century and ts eliot talks about the definition given by samuel johnson samuel johnson has classified all these metaphysical poets together in the lives of abraham cowley he wrote a biography of abraham cowley who is a very famous metaphysical poet and in that biography he clubbed all these metaphysical poets together for the first time and said that these metaphysical poets are not very good why because these poets are trying to combine or you know mix and match heterogeneous ideas by the use of violence for example if you look at the works of john dun he is comparing lovers to pair of compass now comparing lovers to pair of compass doesn't seems to be a very apt comparison so they are joining two heterogeneous dissimilar ideas together by the use of violence and samuel johnson did not like it at all when T.S. Eliot was looking at the work written by Samuel Johnson. He questioned himself that metaphysical poetry aren't good. Is that so? And then somewhere, when he looked at the works of John Donne and other metaphysical poets, he came up with the idea that no, metaphysical poets are fabulous because they were able to combine dissimilar ideas together. Nobody during the Victorian or Romantic period was able to club these two dissimilar images together only metaphysical people were able to do that and that is why he celebrates metaphysical poetry in his essay metaphysical poetry you should remember this thing that samuel johnson passed a derogatory remark on the metaphysical poets he was not happy with the works of metaphysical poets but t s eliot loved the works of metaphysical poets and he said that these poets are justified he has quoted several examples from herbert from john dun from abraham cowley stating that look at the way they have clubbed two dissimilar ideas so beautifully which can never be done by the romantics and victorian writers who preceded them the next key idea by t s eliot is the concept of unification of sensibility and disassociation of sensibility now these two terms seems really really tough to understand it's quite difficult to understand what he's trying to say but i'm telling you guys it's very simple don't let the technical jargon uh, create fear in you it's very simple basically t s eliot as we have seen in the works of metaphysical poetry that he praised the metaphysical poets and their uh, views that two dissimilar things can be put together and can be fused in one and another If you look at the works of Elizabethan writers and Jacobian writers you'll see that T S Eliot also believes in the notion that all the Elizabethan and Jacobian writers were able to synthesize dissimilar things together and were able to fuse them mix them into unified one and this is called unification of sensibility when you are able to take two dissimilar images and you are able to fuse them together so according to T S Eliot writers from the elizabethan and jacobian age were able to fuse different things together and were able to produce works which were classic which were extremely wonderful but during the restoration during enlightenment during romantics and victorian period this unification of sensibility was not present he says that milton milton and dryden these 
writers were masters of the लैंग्वेज बट डे वर नॉट द मास्टर्स ऑफ द सोल लैंग्वेज तो बहुत अच्छे से आती थी मिल्टन एंड ड्राइडन को बट दे वर नॉट एबल टू फ्यूज थिंग्स टूगेदर दे वर नॉट एबल टू मास्टर देयर सोल अ गुड पोइट इज वन हु राइट्स फ्रॉम द सोल एंड दीज राइटर्स वर मास्टर्स ऑफ लैंग्वेज बट दे वर नॉट मास्टर्स ऑफ सोल एंड दिस वॉज ऑल्सो क्वेश्चन इन जून टू थाउजेंड इलेवन नेट एग्जाम दैट Which are the two writers जिनके लिए T. S. Eliot ने कहा है that they are the masters of language but not the masters of the soul. So we find that T. S. Eliot is saying that during the Enlightenment, during the Elizabethan and Jacobian period, writers were able to have unification of sensibility. But for the next two hundred to fifty years, we can see that the writers suffered from disassociation of sensibility. They were not able to fuse things together. Tennyson, Browning, he has commented on these writers, saying that they were not good. They were not able to fuse different things together. They were not able to talk about totally unrelated ideas in their in the same poem. But then he again comes to the modern age, and he says that now in the modern age we can again see unification of sensibility in the works of modern writers because the time is such; it is a changing period. Plus, people are going through so much trauma. There's a lot of depression. World war is happening, and. all these dissimilar fragmented things are there in the world and now all these writers budding writers they are able to talk about these disjointed things these disassociated things together they are able to unify them and that is how they are carrying forward the legacy of elizabethans and jacobians so this is the concept of unification of sensibility and disassociation of sensibility there's a beautiful statement that t.s eliot has used for john dun and he says that for john dun every thought was like an experience this is a quotation by t.s eliot and he is talking about the great metaphysical poet mr john dun There are a lot of other concepts that T. S. Eliot talks about. We have lemon squeezer method. Then he talks about the theory of impersonality in his most celebrated essay, Tradition and Individual Talent. We'll be talking about all these works in detail in my audio online course. You can go to my website arpitakarwa.com and under the section of online course content, you can get a list of all the important literary critics and writers that you must study if you want. to clear ugc net in your first attempt so you can go and check the list of the writers if you like the list you can join my online course you'll find the details of my online course on my website you can even contact on the number displayed above you can also follow me on all the social media platform i'm running a go net quiz which will help you to boost your exam preparation you can also subscribe to this youtube channel because i post videos every saturday and every sunday exclusively for ugc net aspirants and i help them in preparing for the next ugc net exam i'm also running a new paper 1 series in which i'm talking about all the sections that must be covered when you are preparing for ugc net paper 1 so if you want to get notified about all the video lectures which will be coming up next week do subscribe to this channel and also click the bell button which is displayed just near the subscribe button With that note I end my video that's it for this video lecture we'll meet soon till the time we meet next happy learning keep loving literature and stay tuned to arpitakarwa.com